morning, everyone. We are the Ables, and we welcome you to our virtual church service at First Baptist Church West, located in Charlotte, North Carolina. We are so excited you guys have joined us. We hope you will all enjoy the service today and the music that you will be hearing throughout the service. Remember during this pandemic to show your deepest love for one another, because during this time, love is the one thing that unites us all. And time is in his hands. Be 
beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The God hath three in one, Father, Spirit, and Son, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. How great is our God.
worship and adore you. No one else before you. Come thou almighty King. So come. So come. And bow. And bow. Bow down. 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 So come. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for the walk on holy ground that reminds us in a world of chaos that there is still sacred space, space that is carved out of the chaos where we can come and commune with you. Thank you for the holy ground, whether it be in a sanctuary or around a kitchen table, in a car, on a park bench, at a coffee shop. Space that gets transformed and made holy because you are there. And every time we sense your presence, we know we are standing on holy ground. I pray now that Ricky might die, that Christ might speak. Hide me behind the cross. May the words be heard be the words of a risen Savior who offers both spirit and life everlasting. 
For it is in his name and for his sake that we pray. Amen. It's good to be here in the Lord's house on this day that the Lord has made with the people of God. I greet you all, my brothers and sisters, with Jesus' joy. And count it a privilege to be in the number one more time and thank our music ministry for ushering us into the presence of God, reminding us the value and the importance of worship. Amen. Amen. Well, this is the second Sunday of Advent. There is a word that I want to lift with you today that is familiar to you. For those of you who've been listening to me preach over the years during this time of the year, you know that you're going to hear a sermon over that time of the year about Zachariah and Elizabeth. The Christmas story does not start with a young couple on the road in Bethlehem. It actually starts with an older couple first getting news that they would have a child. And so in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, beginning reading at verse 5, hear now the reading of the sacred text. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the divisions of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blameless in all of the commandments and requirements of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God, appointed in the orders of his division according to the customs of the priestly office, he was chosen by lots to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside of the hour of the incense offering. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayers have been heard. You and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while he is yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as the forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. To turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and to the children and the disobedience to the attitude of the righteous, so to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I'm an old man, and my wife is old as well. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God. I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news, and behold, you shall be silent, unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my word, which will be fulfilled in his proper time. The people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering at his delay in the temple, but when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them, and he remained mute. When the days of his priestly service was over, he went back home. And after these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way that the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. Pray with me, if you will, for a little while this morning from this subject, What Happens in Worship? What happens in worship? There are times when the revelation of God among us comes in unexpected places, like the backside of a desert in a flaming bush. However, there are other occasions when God shows up not in unexpected places, 
but in the very places that we would expect to find him, even when our faith has become too dull to see him. The change that God is about to usher into the world is announced in the temple of God doing the ritual of worship to a priest that's serving God. The change is announced by an angel that appears while the priest is doing his job and the people are praying outside. Neither the people nor the priests expected God to do what he did that day, but their participation in the ritual of worship brought them into a unique encounter. That's the thing about worship. Whereas we may think we know what will happen and what to expect, there are those moments when God catches us off guard and we are not fully prepared for what he wants to do with us or through us. We sometimes become such slaves to the ritual of worship that we miss what worship really is. You see, worship is not us offering our prayers. It's not our singing. It's not our giving that makes worship worship. What makes worship in its essence is our willingness to spend time with God. Worship is the way we keep God on our calendar. Worship it's what reminds us that there is more about us than what we can do and where we come from or our social standing in the world. We are created to worship and to know fellowship with God throughout all eternity. Augustine, the great church father, says that our hearts are always restless until we find rest in you. Worship is what reminds us that God is to be the center of our lives and that God can use us even when we cannot see how it is possible. Zechariah had forgotten that central truth about worship and had reduced it to a duty and responsibility, not a search to know God. Now before we become too critical of Zechariah, you need to understand something. Life can have a way of wearing down the most devout person. A righteous and blameless man had forgotten what it meant to expect anything different from God than what he already knew. You see, when you live under a continued reminder of disappointment, of what you had hoped for in your life, and it does not appear it will occur, hope has a way of fading with time. When you live surrounded by the witness of oppression and see Jewish lives cheapened and demeaned by an empire that does not see them worthy of full citizenship or humanity, the flame of hope can grow dim. It's hard remaining hopeful in the face of naked power that will stack the courts, place children in cages, rob women of their reproductive rights, and sanction political assassinations. No matter what we know about worship, there, there are times when worship is simply doing our duty because it was our time to be present. What makes this story so exciting to me and why I keep coming back to it year after year is that even when worship is not all that it should be and can be, worship is what God uses to tell the world that change is on the way. It is while at worship that Zechariah discovers the news that countless generations have been waiting to receive. The Messiah is on the way, and a prophet that will prepare his way is about to enter into the world. Our season of waiting is over, and it all happened in worship. While Zechariah is lighting the incense to be offered at the altar, while the people are outside the temple praying, while sacrifices are being made by other priests in service of worship, God broke the waiting silence with an angelic pronouncement. It all happened during worship. It all happened during worship, and it reminds us afresh of the power of worship. So what lessons are waiting for us to learn about what happens in worship? And what happened in worship that day the world changed? Well, first, in worship, Zechariah encountered the presence of God. 
that there are those today that speak of worship as an experience. They see worship as something that is happening with a focus on participation. If we just participate the right way and do our part, then God will be obligated to show up and bless us. The worship experience seems to place the emphasis upon the individual worshiper and what they can receive from the experience. I tend to think of worship not as an experience, but as an encounter. An encounter where our lives are confronted by the sacred. A worship encounter is not so much about the worshiper as it is about what God wants to do with us and what he wants to do in creation. A worship encounter is not concerned about the individual desires of the worshiper, but causes the worshiper to know that God has made a decision and the acceptance or rejection of that decision by others will have no bearing on the outcome. A worship encounter puts us on holy ground where excuses have no merit, and we are made to let go of anything that has the potential to make us prideful. Shoes, titles, or career plans. A worship encounter also strips us of our preconceived ideas about what is possible. All of us bring a certain amount of prejudice on the journey of life. Things that have influenced and shaped us to see the world in a particular way. Worship encounter helps us to see in the presence of a miracle working God that there is nothing that's impossible. God's presence always elevates our thinking to where we no longer define ourselves by our limitations but by our possibilities with God's help. The very presence of the angel before Zechariah was a sign that God had come to help his people. And the remarkable thing is that helping the people, God decided to use Zechariah and Elizabeth in ways that they no longer thought that they could be used. A worship encounter are the kinds of things that reveals God birthing something new in the lives of his people. A worship encounter helps us to see how change is always under God's control and he can change what he wills when he wills. And this is what makes Advent so powerful. For it teaches us that God is in the changing business even when we cannot see how the change will occur. It is this truth that gives me hope in the midst of a pandemic. It is this belief that each time I worship God, that God might show himself to me in ways that invites me to partner with him in the change that is coming. In worship, Zechariah encountered the presence of God and it changed everything. But there is something else that the text tells us. And that is in worship, Zechariah was told that God had heard his prayers. And what is clear that the particular prayer that the angel references that God has heard was Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer for a child. The promise of a child does not start with a young girl in a remote village. The promise of a child starts with an elderly couple that had come to believe that their time for rearing children had passed. God's delayed response to the couple's prayer was no indication that God had not heard their prayers. Hear me carefully now. If we are not careful, we will beat ourselves up over unanswered prayers, assuming that if we would have done something differently, that God would have responded with the desired answer. But we should never forget that prayer is not a wish list that is submitted to God like a Christmas list. Prayer is the way God invites us to communicate with him. Prayer is not designed to give us what we want. Prayer is designed to keep us and God on speaking terms. 
Prayer is designed to keep us in God on speaking terms. Zechariah is told that his prayers have been heard, that God has not ignored them. And that simply because a delay comes in the prayer that you have been offered, it does not mean that God has not answered and it does not mean that God will not answer. But that continued unanswered prayer is what keeps you talking to God. The angel provides Zechariah with affirmation that his time spent in prayer was not wasted, that God was listening and that God was working in ways that were not fully apparent, but God was working. I don't know how he does it. It is the mystery of creation. All I know is that when I lay down and go to bed at night and go to sleep, I'm glad that God works the night shift. I don't have to sit up and watch over things. Because they used to tell me about a little song we used to sing all day and all night. Angels keep a watch over me. I'm glad that we serve a God that neither sleeps nor slumbers. That God is always watching. That God is always listening. Isaiah declares that his ear is not too dull that he cannot hear. And his arm is not too short that he cannot save. The answer prayer would not just be for the benefit of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Think about it. If God would have answered Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer earlier, just maybe the child born to them would not have been the prophet that prepared the way of the people for the coming Messiah. The answered prayer would not be just for the benefit of Zachariah and Elizabeth to celebrate a child, but God would use the child to usher in a new day of religious devotion. Repentance and justice would be at the heart of his message as a means of calling people back to God. God was not just responding to the prayers of Zachariah and Elizabeth. God was responding to the prayers of countless persons that had cried out to God for change. Change from an oppressive empire, change from a priestly system that showed too little compassion for the masses, change for a different kind of kingdom, one built on the will of God. Always remember that a delayed response to prayer is not a denial of prayer. God hears our prayers, and the knowledge that God hears is enough to keep us praying hopeful for the change that we see. In worship, Zechariah learned that God had heard his prayers. But there is a final thing the text helps us to see. And this might be the greatest theological twist of the story. Makes sense for God to appear in the temple where the priest is worshiping. Makes sense. Makes sense from what we've been taught theologically that God hears our prayers. Here's the part that puzzles me and just doesn't make any sense. But he does it anyway. In worship, Zechariah learned that not even his disbelief could keep God from doing what he planned to do through him and Elizabeth to change the world. Mm. Whereas faith in God is important and belief in God's promises have a place, we should never be confused about God's ability to do what he says, whether we believe it or not. Doubt is part of what makes us human because we see through a narrow passage. There's so much about the world and about God and even about ourselves, that is blocked from our full view. At best, we only have partial information. Zechariah just cannot see how it is possible for God to do what the angel says given his advanced age and the age of his mate. The news seems too good to be true, and Zechariah cannot bring himself to believe it. 
Angel, you meant to go down the hall a little further. You're at the wrong priestly station. I'm too old now. And if you hadn't gotten the text message or the email, you also need to know that I do not have a young wife. I have an old wife as well. Neither one of us are up for any more of what you suggest. That time has faded. That time has passed us by. That would have been good news 20 years ago, but it's too late now. Yet the failure of Zechariah to believe does not keep God from doing what he planned to do through them. Human belief is never elevated above the sovereignty of God. God does not need us to believe for him to act. Now belief is a wonderful thing when we have it because it is a sign of our surrender to the will of God. But God is not handcuffed to whether or not if we surrender to him or not. And if you doubt that, ask Pharaoh. God does not need us to believe to act. Belief is a sign of our surrender to the will of God, but belief is not necessary for God to do what he is determined to do as a sign of his covenant-keeping ability. Zacharias' disbelief leaves him in an altered state. He is muted, unable to speak, but his altered state does not interfere with him and Elizabeth's ability to conceive a child. For years, what had been possible is now possible because it aligns with the plan of God. What Luke is telling us in this powerful story about worship is that real worship is not about us. Real worship is always about God. A God that can do anything, even things that seem impossible. And through the birth narratives of Luke about John and Jesus, it is the witness of how with God, nothing is impossible. Not even our failure to believe can stand in the way of a God that's on the move. Now the good news is this, and here is your shout for the sermon today. Here is the good news right here. The blessings of God often do not come to us because of, but many times they come to us in spite of. God doesn't bless me because I'm good. Sometimes God blesses me in spite of me being bad. God doesn't make ways for me because I'm always faithful. Sometimes he makes ways in spite of me being faithless. I'm so glad that God does not do everything in my life because of, but every now and then he shows up in spite of. And somebody this morning I know has an in spite of testimony. When I was running ragged all down the street, not doing anything that my mom or my daddy or anybody told me to do, in spite of that, God looked out for me and kept me safe and brought me back. In spite of. In spite of the bad decisions I made in my life, somehow another God has raced the board, wiped them away, and gave me a chance to get it right again. In spite of, in spite of eating all the pork I can get my hands on, God keeps holding my blood pressure down. In spite of. Yeah. Sometimes God does not bless us because, but in spite of. And in spite of Zacharias' disbelief, God still does the very thing he promised that he would do. And in worship, Zachariah learned that not even his disbelief could keep God from doing what he planned to do through him and Elizabeth to change the world. I don't know about you, but I believe that the Lord wants to do something special in this church. Not because of, but in spite of. 
in spite of a pandemic that has us worshiping virtually, I still believe that God is on the move. In spite of the political rancor that continues even after the election, I still believe that God wants to do something unique and special with us to change this city and to change this community and provide a witness of faithfulness to him. Can you live this day in sense of that anticipation and walk with me and pray with me and trust and believe with me so that we will be ready that when God reveals what he wants to do with us and through us, that we will not be handicapped by disbelief, but we'll be able to say, let it be, Lord, let it be. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for a word about worship and helping us to see some things about worship that we sometimes miss because it's right up under our nose. And sometimes we're unable to see the forest for the trees. Help us never to take these moments in worship for granted, for they're far more than ritual or routine, something far more than time that we spend doing something because it's on our schedule. It is the moments that we spend in your presence. And because we spend in your presence, you speak to us. You hold us and draw us near to you. You help us to see some glimpse of what you want from us as we make you the center of our lives. Oh God be praised. Be glorified in our lives and in this place and in all that we do. Now take these feeble words and anoint them and transform them through the power of your spirit that they might find lodging places in the hearts of your listeners. And they may they hear not my words, but the spirit speaking to them about worship about a God who wants to enter into a deeper relationship with them and do something impossible because it's not impossible for him. Honor your word, may it not return into your void, but may it serve the purpose that you desire and design for your glory. Amen. I want to give you a few moments to Get your juice and your bread, what other items that you might be using to share in Holy Communion as we share virtually in the Lord's table. In the Baptist tradition, we teach that there are two ordinances, baptism and Holy Communion. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, broke it, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body that has been given for you took the cup and he filled it with wine and told him to drink ye all of it. This is my blood that has been shed for you for the remission of sin and the opening of the New Testament. And as often as we do this, we show forth our remembrance of his life, of his death, of his suffering, his resurrection, but also his promise to come back for a church without a spot, blemish, or wrinkle. The Apostle Paul writing about the sacred rite of communion tells us that we should go through periods of self-examination to ensure that we're in right relationships with God and with one another. So if there are sins that we need to confess, we confess those sins in our time of prayer. We accept the forgiveness that Christ offers us and we come again to table fellowship. So as we pray God's blessings upon these elements, in your own place and space that you're in. I ask for you to pray your own self-examination time as you prepare to participate in this sacred rite that unites and holds the church together as the body of Christ. Most gracious and all-wise God, our Father, it is again that we come around a sacred table grateful for the sacrifice of the body and blood of our Christ 
that makes us one in him. We pray your blessings upon the bread and the wine that we shall partake, but we also pray your blessings upon your people wherever they might be. We pray for healing for those who are sick. We pray for resources for those who are in need. We pray for answers for those who are perplexed. We pray that whatever need that we might encounter, it might be fulfilled in table fellowship. Bless us now and keep us, and we will give your name the glory, honor, and praise both now and forever. Amen. Because we are one body, taking the bread, we eat together. And because we have one Lord, taking the cup, we drink together. We are told that after they participated in that rite, they shared by way of song and went out to the Mount of Olives. We don't have a Mount of Olives to go to, but wherever we are, we can go telling the good news about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. As we share that news with one another, God's rich and abundant blessings upon you. Thank you so much for joining and being with us today in worship. Would encourage you to please continue to support the work that we're doing in the ministry. Would love to have you to support us with your prayers as well as with your gifts. Take a look at the screen if you are interested in making a contribution to support the ministry. 
as well as some more additional information in which we're doing to make a difference in our community. Receive now these words of blessing and benediction. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and may the Lord give you peace both now and forever. Amen.